Hello there everyone, good evening. I hope you're doing well. And if you're over the other side of the world, good morning. I hope you've woken up and got out of bed in good spirits, raring to go. This evening, through our Great British Short Stories, we will discover another new author of a short stories, and I'm sure he's got um, many works, novels and short stories, and that is Len Dayton, who I've never heard of before, and I'll tell you a little bit more about him in a moment. So we're going to read Len Dayton's Winter's Morning, and I think he has a, a longer novel, which this is either, it may be a section from or a short story version, but there appears to be a longer novel. And that's what I'll be sharing with you this evening. I'll just tell you a little bit about the novel, which it appears the short story is about, and then I'll do a brief bit of housekeeping, and then we'll get right into the story. So it says here, Winter is a 1987 novel by Len Dayton which follows the lives of a German family from 1899 to 1945. Now, this short story is not long enough to have uh, this big narrative arc, so it's not that. At the same time, the novel provides a historical background to several of the characters in Dayton's nine novels about the British intelligence agent Bernard Sampson who grew up in the ruins of Berlin after the Second World War. And as I say, that's the general gist of what it's about. I think some of the characters are the same, but this is the short story version. And so, as I always say, if you're enjoying the live reads and the variety of books that I share here at Book Club, please make sure, if you haven't yet, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and if you really want to help us grow, consider sharing the show with your friends or on your social media. That's the best way to get it out. Many people aren't receiving the notifications when I go live, even though they've clicked subscribe and the bell. So, again, the best way to uh, to help the show grow would be to share it yourselves. Of course, if, if you really enjoy the, the stories and a couple of um, bits of housekeeping, what's coming up? Tomorrow is the 1st of December, so we will begin our reading of Jostine Garda's The Christmas Mystery, the 1st of December, and on Sunday night we'll be reading another fine autobiography from Roald Dahl, His Going Solo. So we had a brilliant time on Sunday just gone, reading his boy, the early part of his life, and so it's only natural that we should read Going Solo this weekend to follow on and close out that Royal Dar autobiography. And so, yeah, let's see what this is about. I think it's going to be War um, 206, Winter's Morning. I think it's going to be a war-themed story. And I'll just read a bit about um, Len Dayton. It says here, Nations make wars, men fight them. The reason why are seldom as obvious as they might seem. In his best-selling spy novels, Dayton has frequently exposed the irony of these reasons. In his short stories also, he writes with a sharp appreciation of war's illogicalities. Illogicalities, that's a, an interesting word, quite a mouthful. Hello Le Leanne, how are you today? Welcome, I hope you're doing well. And let's get into it. Winter's Morning by Len Dayton. Major Richard Winter was a tall man with hard black eyes, a large nose and close-cropped hair. He hated getting out of bed, especially when assigned to dawn patrols on a cold morning. As he always said, and by now the whole officer's mess could chant it in unison, If there must be dawn patrols in winter, let there be no winter in the dawn patrols. Winter believed that if they stopped flying them, the enemy would also stop. In 1914, the front-line soldiers of both armies had decided to live and let live for a few weeks. So now, during the coldest weather, some squadrons had allowed the dawn patrol to become a token couple of scouts hurrying over the frosty wire of no man's land after breakfast. The warm spirit of humanity that Christmas 1914 conjured had given way to the cold reality of self-preservation. Those wiser squadrons kept the major offensive patrol until last night, when the sun was mellow and the air less turbulent. 
At St Antoine Farm airfield, however, dawn patrol was still a gruelling obligation that none could escape. Oatmeal, toast, eggs and sausage, sir. Like everyone else in the mess tent except Winter, the waiter spoke in a soft whisper that befitted the small hours. Winter preferred his normal, booming voice. Just coffee, he said, but hot, really hot. Very good, Major. Very good, Major Winter, sir. The wind blew with enough force to make the canvas flap and roar as though at any moment the whole tent would blow away. From outside they heard the sound of tent pegs being hammered more firmly into the hard, chalky soil. A young lieutenant sitting opposite offered his cigarette case, but Winter waved it aside in favour of a dented tin from which he took cheap dark tobacco and a paper to fashion a misshapen cigarette. The young officer did not light one of his own in the hope that he would be invited to share in this ritual, but Winter lit up, blew the noxious smoke across the table, coughed twice and pushed the tin back into his pocket. Each time someone entered through the flap, there was a clatter of canvas and ropes and a gust of cold air, but Winter looked in vain for a triangle of grey sky. The only light came from six acetylene lamps that were placed along the breakfast table. The pump of one of them was faulty, its light was dull and it left a smell of mould on the air. The other lamps hissed loudly and their, and their eerie greenish light shone upon the mess silver, fold and folded linen and empty plates. The table had been set the previous night for the regular squadron breakfast at 8am and the mess servants were anxious that these three early duty pilots shouldn't disarrange it too much. Everyone stiffened as they heard the clang of the engine cylinder and con and colonel rod that hung outside for use as a gas warning. Winter laughed when Ginger, the tallest pilot on the squadron, emerged from the darkness rubbing his head and scowling in pain. Ginger walked over to the ancient piano and pulled back the edge of the tarpaulin that protected it from damp. He played a silly melody with one finger. Hot coffee, sir, the waiter emphasised the word hot and the liquid spluttered as it poured over the metal spout. Winter clamped his cold hands around the pot like a drowning man clinging to flotsam. He twisted his head to see Ginger's watch. 6.25. What a time to be having breakfast. It was still night. Winter yawned and wrapped his ankle-length fur coat around his legs. New pilots thought that his fur overcoat had earned him his nickname of The Bear, but that had come months before the coat. The others kept a few seats between themselves and Winter. They spoke only when he addressed them, and then answered only in brief formalities. You flying with me, Lieutenant? The young ex-cavalry officer looked around the table. Ginger was munching his bread and jam and gave no sign of having heard. Yes, sir, said the young man. How many hours? Always the same question. Everyone here was graded solely by flying time, though few cared whether the hours had been spent stunting, fighting or just hiding in the clouds. Twenty-eight and a half solo, sir. Twenty-eight and a half, nodded Winter. Twenty-eight and a half solo. Did you hear that, Lieutenant? The question was addressed to Ginger, who was paying unusually close attention to the sugar bowl. Winter turned back to the young pilot. You'd better watch yourself. And I think this uh, is funny... I didn't know, um, I'd just pick them at random uh, from this great British short stories, but it's funny that um, they're talking about flight time solo, going solo, which is, again, Roald Dahl's title to his uh, second part of his autobiography, going solo in the aeroplane, in the squadron. So funny that. Bit of a synchronicity, but I suppose it's a book about war, so uh, maybe not so much. Winter divided new pilots into assets and liabilities at either side of 70 hours. Assets sometimes became true friends and close comrades. Assets might even be told your misgivings. The demise of assets could spread grief through the whole mess. This boy would be dead within a month, Winter decided. He looked at him, handsome in the pallid, aristocratic manner of such youngsters. His tender skin was chapped by the rain and there were cold sores on his lips. His blonde hair was too long for Winter's taste and his eyebrows girlish. This boy's kid had never known a quartermaster's shelf. It had come from an expensive tailor, a cavalry tunic fashionably nipped at the waist, tight trousers and boots as supple as velvet. 
The ensemble was supplemented by accessories from the big department stores. His cigarette case was the sort that, it was advertised, could stop a bullet. The young man returned Richard Winter's close examination with interest. So this rude fellow, so proud of his chauffeur's fur coat, was the famous Bear Winter, who had twenty-nine enemy aircraft to his credit. He was a blotchy-faced devil with bloodshot eyes and a fierce, twitching eyebrow that he sometimes rubbed self-consciously, as if he knew that it undid his carefully contrived aplomb. The youngster wondered whether he would end up looking like this, dirty shirt, long fingernails, unshaven jaw and a cauliflower knobbly head, shaved razor close to avoid lice. Except for his quick eyes and occasional wry smile, Winter looked like the archetypal Prussian Schweinhund. Major Richard Winter had been flying in action for nearly two years without a leave. He was a natural pilot who flown every type of plane the makers could provide, and some enemy planes too. He could dismantle and assemble an engine as well as any squadron fitter, and as a precaution against jams he personally supervised the loading of every bullet he would use. Why must he be so rude to young pilots, who hero-worshipped him, and would follow him to hell itself? And yet that too was part of the legend. The young officer swallowed. May I ask, sir, where you bought your magnificent fur coat? Winter gulped the rest of his coffee and got to his feet as he heard the first of the scout's engine start. Came off a mug I shot down in September, he bellowed. It's from a fashionable shop, I'm told. Never travelled much myself, except here to France. Winter poked his fingers through four holes in the front. Did the boy go a shade paler, or had he imagined in the glare of the gas lights? Don't let some bastard get your overcoat, Sonny. No, sir, said the boy. Behind him, Ginger grinned. The bear was behaving true to form. Ginger dug, dug his knife into a tin of butter he'd scrounged from the kitchen and then offered it to the cavalry officer. The boy sniffed the tin doubtfully. It smelled rancid, but he scraped a little onto his bread and swamped it with jam to hide the taste. This your first patrol? asked Ginger. No, sir. Yesterday one of the chaps took me as far as Cambrai to see the lie of the land. Before I did that, a few hours around the aerodrome here. These scouts are new to me. Did you see anything at Cambrai yesterday? Anti-aircraft gunfire. Winter interrupted. Let's see if we can do better than that for you today, Sonny. He leaned close to the boy and asked in his most winning voice. Think you could down a couple before lunch? The boy didn't answer. Winter winked at Ginger and buttoned his fur coat. The other motors had started, so Winter shouted, That's it, Sonny. Don't try to be a hero. Don't try to be an ace in the first week you're out here. Just keep under my stinking armpit. Just keep close. Close, you understand? Bloody damn close. Winter flicked his cigarette end onto the canvas floor of the tent and put his heel on it. He coughed and growled, Hurry up, although he could see that the others were waiting for him. From the far side of the windswept tarmac, Major Winter's sergeant, Fitter, saw a flash of greenish light as the mess tent flapped open and the duty pilots emerged. Winter came towards him out of the darkness, walking slowly because of his thick woollen underwear and thigh-length fleece boots. <coughs> his hands were tucked into his sleeves for warmth, and his head was sunk into the high collar that stood up around his ears like a cowl. Exactly like a monk, thought the sergeant, not for the first time. Perhaps Winter cultivated this resemblance. He outlived all the pilots who had been here when he arrived to become as high in rank as scout pilots ever became. Yet his moody, introspective manner and his offhand attitude to high and low had prevented him from becoming the commanding officer. So Winter remained a taciturn misanthrope, without any close companions except for Ginger, who had the same skills of survival and responded equally coldly to overtures of friendship from the younger pilots. The sergeant fitter, Pops, had been here even longer than the, than the bear. He'd always looked after his aeroplane right from his first patrol, when Winter was the same sort of noisy, friendly fool as the kid doing his first patrol this morning. Aeroplanes, he should have said. The bear had written off seven of them. Pop spat at the fumes from the engine, collected in his lungs. It was a bad business watching these kids vanish one by one. 
Last year it had been considered lucky to touch Pop's bald head before takeoff. For twelve months the fitter had refused to leave, knowing that the pilots were truly anxious about their joke. But Pop's bald head had proved as fallible as all other talismans. One after another the faces had been replaced by similar faces until they were all the same pink-faced, smiling boy. Hey, Becky Miller, I'm glad about that. Um, did you change something to get the notification? Did you hit the bell or did you do anything to get it or um, did it just come today? I'm curious, Becky, because a few people have said they're not getting them. <clears throat> Pops spat again, then cut the motor and climbed out of the cockpit. The other planes were also silent. From the main road came the noise of an army convoy hurrying to get to its destination before daylight made it vulnerable to attack. Any moment now, artillery observers would be climbing into the balloons that enabled them to see far across no man's land. Good morning, Major. Morning, Pops. The old firm, eh, sir? Yes, you, me and Ginger, said Winter, laughing in a way that he had not done in the mess tent. Sometimes I think we are fighting this war all on our own, Pops. We are, chuckled Pops. This is the way the bear used to laugh. The rest of them are just part-timers, sir. Hello, Hannah. No problem about that. It's good that you're here. It's, the story's just getting started anyway. We're, um, we're at war. Soldiers about to head off flying. I'm afraid they are, Pops, said Winter. He climbed stiffly into the cramped cockpit and, called, and pulled the fur coat around him. There was hardly enough room to move his elbows, and the tiny seat creaked under his weight. The instruments were simple, compass, altimeter, speedometer and rev counter. The workmanship was crude and the finish was hasty, like a toy car put together by a bungling father. Switches off, said Pops. Winter looked at the brass switches and then pressed them as if not sure of his vision. Switches off, he said. Fuel on, said Pops. Fuel on. Suck in. Suck in. Pops cuddled the polished wooden prop blade to his ear. It was cold against his face. He walked around it to prime the cylinders. That was the things Pop liked about Winter. When he said off, you knew it was off. Pops waited while Winter pulled on his close-fitting flying helmet. Its fur trimmed a tonsure of leather that had faded to the colour of flesh. Contact! Contact! Okay, great news, Becky. You'll never miss a live stream again, so that's, <laughs> that's good. I hope you can, can make them. <clears throat> Pops stretched high into the dark night and brought the blade down with a graceful sweep of his hands. Like brass and percussion responding to a conductor, the engine began its performance with a blinding sheet of yellow flame and a drum roll. Winter throttled back, slowing the drum and changing the shape and colour of the flame to a gaseous feather of blue that danced around the exhaust pipes and made his face swell and contract as the shadows exploded and died. Winter held a blue flickering hand above his head. He felt the wheels lurch forward as the chocks were removed and he dabbed at the rudder bar so that he could see around the aircraft's nose. There was no brake or pitch adjustment, and Winter let her gather speed while keeping the tail skid tight down upon the ground. They took off in Vic Threes, bumping across frozen ruts in the balding field, with only the glare of the exhaust to light their going. It was easy for Winter. As formation leader, he relied on the others to watch his engine and formate on him accordingly. At full screaming throttle, they climbed over the trees at the south end of the airfield. A gusty crosswind hit them. Winter banked a wingtip dangerously close to the treetops rather than slew into the boy's line of flight. Ginger did the same to avoid his major. The boy, unused to these heavy operational machines with high compression engines, found his aircraft almost wrenched from his grasp. He yawed across the trees a hundred yards from the others before he put her nose up to regain his position in formation. Close. He must keep close. Winter spared him only a brief glance over the shoulder between searching the sombre sky for the minuscule dots of other aeroplanes, for by now the black lid of night had tilted and an orange wedge prized open the eastern horizon. 
Winter led the way to the front lines, the others tight against his tailplane. The first light of the sun revealed a land covered by a grey aider-down of mist, except where a loose thread of river matched the silver of the sky. Over the front line they turned south. Winter glanced eastwards, where the undersides of some low clouds were leaking dribbles of gold paint onto the earth. As the world awakened, stoves were lit and villages were marked by dirty smoke that trailed southwards. Major Winter noted the north wind and glanced back to see Ginger's aeroplane catch the first light of the sun as it bent far enough over the horizon to reach them at 15,000 feet above the earth. The propeller blades made a perfect circle of yellow gauze through which reflections from the polished metal cowling winked and wavered as the aeroplanes rose and sank gently on the clear morning air. Here, on the Arras section of the front, the German and French lines could be clearly seen as careless scrawls in the livid chalk. Near the river Scarp at Fucci, Winter saw a constant flicker of artillery shells exploding, the morning hate, pinheads of pink only just visible through the mist, counter-battery fire, he guessed, from its concentration some way behind the lines. He, he writes very nicely, doesn't he, old uh, Len Dayton? Very descriptive, very, um, yeah, very, very nice descriptive sections here. He pulled his fur collar as high around his face as it would go, then raised his goggles. The icy wind made his eyes water, but not before he had scanned the entire horizon and banked enough to see below him. He pulled the goggles down again. It was more comfortable, but they acted like blinkers. Already ice had formed in the crevices of his eyes, and he felt its pinpricks like daggers. His nose was dumb, and he let go of the stick to massage it. The cavalry, o the cal the cavalry officer, Willie, they called him, was staring anxiously at the other two airplanes. He probably thought that the banking search was a wing-rocking signal that the enemy was sighted. They read too many cheap magazines, these kids, but then so had Winter before his first posting out here. Ace of the Black Cross, Flying Daredevils, True War Stories. On Sunday, Hannah, Sunday at 8pm. So yes, I hope you're able to join. I'm looking forward to sharing it very similar sort of themes to this this story uh, winter's morning so yeah i can't wait to share that well now winter knew true war stories when old men decided to barter young men for pride and profit the transaction was called war it was another richard winter who had come to war an eighteen-year-old child with a scrapbook of cuttings about Blerio and the Wright brothers, a room full of models which his mother wasn't permitted to dust, and thirteen hours of dangerous experiments on contraptions that were bigger but no more airworthy than his dusty models. That Richard Winter was long since dead. Gone was the gangling boy whose only regret about the war was leaving his mongrel dog. Winter smiled as he remembered, remonstrating with some pilots who were using fluffy yellow chicks for target practice on the pistol range. That was before he'd seen men burned alive, or worse, men half burned alive. He waved to frighten little Willie, who was desperately trying to fly skillfully enough to hold formation on his bad-tempered flight commander. Poor little swine, two dots almost ahead of them to the southeast, far below. Ginger had seen them already, but the boy wouldn't notice them until they were almost bumping into him. All the new kids were like that. It's not a matter of eyesight, it's a matter of knowledge. Just as a tracker on a safari knows that a wide golden blob in the shadow of a tree at midday is going to be a pride of lions resting after a meal, so in the morning an upright golden blob in the middle of a, pla of a plain is a cheetah waiting to make a kill. So at 5,000 feet, that near the lines, with shell fire visible, there were going to be enemy two-seaters on artillery observation duty. First, he must be sure that there wasn't a flight of scouts in ambush above them. He looked at the cumulus and decided that it was too far from the two-seaters to be dangerous. Brownish-black smoke patches appeared around the plains as the anti-aircraft guns went into action. 
Winter raised his goggles. Already they had begun to mist up because of the perspiration generated by his excitement. He waggled his wings and began to lose height. He headed east to come round behind them from out of the sun. Ginger loosed off a short burst of fire to be sure his guns were not frozen. Winter and the boy did the same. The altitude had rendered him too deaf to hear it as it m more than a tickling, as of an anxious pulse. Winter took another careful look round. Flashes of artillery shells were bursting on the ground just ahead of the enemy's plane tracks. Plane's track. The ground was still awash with blue gloom, although here and there hillocks and trees were crisply golden in the harsh, oblique light of morning. The hedges and buildings threw absurdly long shadows, and a church steeple was bright yellow. Winter now saw that there were four more two-seaters about a mile away. They were beginning to turn. Winter put down his nose and glanced in his mirror to be sure the others were close behind him. The airspeed indicator showed well over a hundred miles an hour and was still rising. The air stream sang across the taut wires with a contented musical note. He held the two aeroplanes steady on his nose, giving the stick and the rudder only the slightest of touches as the speed increased their sensitivity. Five hundred yards. These two still hadn't seen their attackers. The silly bastards were hanging over the side, anxious not to get their map references wrong. Four hundred. The boy saw them much later than Ginger and Winter. He stared in wonder at these foreign aeronauts. At a time when only a handful of madmen had ever tried this truly magical science, and when every flight was a pioneering experiment to discover more about this new world, he hated the idea of killing fellow enthusiasts. He would much rather have exchanged anecdotes and for information with them. Ginger and Winter had no such thoughts. Their minds were delivered to their subconscious. They were checking instruments, cocking guns and judging ever-changing altitudes, range and deflection. If that stupid kid fires too early, damn him, damn him, oh well. Ginger and Winter opened fire too. Damn, a real ace gets in close, close, close. They'd both learn that, if nothing else. Stupid boy. The artillery observation leader pulled back and the stick and turned so steeply as almost to collide with the two-seater to his left. He knew what he was doing. He was determined to make himself a maximum deflection shot. Winter kept his gun going all the way through the turn. The tracer bullet seemed unnaturally bright because his eyes had become accustomed to the morning's gloom. Like glowworms, they were eating the enemy's tailplane. This is what decided a dogfight. Vertical turns, tighter and tighter still. Control stick held into the belly, which toes and eyes alert so that the aeroplane doesn't slide an inch. Oh, sorry. Control stick held into the belly with toes and eyes alert so that the aeroplane doesn't slide an inch out of a turn that glued him to the horizon. It was sheer flying skill. The sun, a watery blob of gold, seemed to drop through his man, his main plane, and on to his engine. Winter could feel the rate of turn of, by the hardness of his seat. He pulled even harder on the stick to make the tracers crawl along the fuselage. The smell from his guns was acrid, and the thin smoke and heat from the blurring breech blocks caused his target to wobble like a jelly. First the observer was hit, then the pilot, throwing up their hands like badly made marionettes. The two-seater stalled, falling suddenly like a dead leaf. Winter rolled. Two more aeroplanes slid across his sights. He pushed his stick forward to follow the damaged two-seater down, hearing guns very close to his head. He saw the fabric of his upper plane prodded to tatters by invisible fingers which continued their destruction to the point of breaking a centre section strut and throwing its splinters into his face. His reflexes took over and he went into a vertical turn, tighter than any two-seater could manage. Aeroplanes were everywhere. Bright green and blue wings and black crosses passed across his sights, along with roundels and dark green fabric. One of them caught the light of the sun and its wings flashed with brilliant blue. All the time Winter kept half an eye upon his rear-view mirror, a two-seater nose down towards his tail, but Winter avoided him effortlessly. Ginger came under him, thumping his machine guns with one of the hammers which they kept in their cockpits. He was red-faced with desertion as he tried to clear the stoppage by force. At this height every movement, movement was exhausting. Ginger wiped his face with the back of his gauntlet, and his goggles came unclipped and blew away in the airstream. 
much better than Top Gun, isn't it? This book. <laughs> Definitely more exciting, isn't it? You agree, yeah? <laughs> Winter had glimpsed Ginger for only a fraction of a second, but he'd seen enough to tell him the whole story. If it was a split round, he'd never unjam it. Trees flashed under him. The combat had brought them lower and lower, as it always did. The new boy was half a mile away and below him. Winter knew it was his job to look after the kid, but he'd not leave Ginger with a jammed gun. A plane rushed past before he had a chance to fire. Winter saw one of the two-seaters behind Ginger. My God, they were tough, these fellows. You'd think they'd be away with their tails between their legs. Hold on, Ginger, here I come. Dive, climb, roll, a perfect Immelman. A perfect Immelman turn, the world upside down, above him the dark earth, below him the dawn sky, like a rasher of streaky bacon. Hold that. He centred the stick, keeping the enemy's huge man-plane centred in his sight. Fire! The gun shook the whole airframe and made a foul stink. He kicked the rudder and slid down past the enemy's tail, with no more than six feet to spare. A white-faced observer was frozen in fear, up, up, up. Winter leaned out of his cockpit to see below him. The new boy is in trouble. One of the two seaters is passing him, or is pasting him. The poor kid is trying for the cloud bank, but that's half a mile away. Never throttle back in combat, you fool. White smoke, radiator steam, no worse. Vaporising petrol from a punctured tank or fractured lead. If it touches a hot pipe, he'll go up like a torch. You should have kept close, Sonny. What did I tell you? What do I always tell them? Winter flick rolled and turned to cover Ginger's tail. Woof! A flamer. The boy. Will he jump or burn? The whole world was made up of jumpers or burners. There were no parachutes for pilots yet, so either way a man died. The machine was breaking up, burning pieces of fuel-soaked wreckage fell away. It would be difficult to invent a more efficient bonfire. Take thin strips of timber, nail them into a framework, stretch fabric over it, and paint it with highly flammable dope. Into the middle of this, build a metal tank for 30 gallons of high-grade fuel. Move air across it at 50 miles per hour. Winter couldn't decide whether the boy had jumped. A pity, the chaps in the mess always wanted to know that. E even enough even though few could bear to ask. Doesn't sound like much fun, does it? No parachutes, no way to eject. Are you a burner or a jumper? Difficult questions, eh? The dogfight had scattered the aeroplanes in every direction, but Ginger was just below him and a two-seater was approaching from the south. Ginger waved. His gun was working. Winter side slipped down behind a two-seater and gave it a burst of fire. The gunner was probably dead, for no return fire came and the gun rocked useless, uselessly on its mounting. The pilot turned steeply on full throttle and kept going in an effort to come round in a vertical turn to Winter's rear. But Ginger was waiting for that. They'd been through this many times. Ginger fired as the two-seater was halfway through the turn, raking it from engine to tail. The whole aeroplane lurched drunkenly, and then the port main plane snapped, its main spar eaten through by Ginger's bullets. As it fell nose down, the wings folded back along the fuselage like an umbrella being closed. The shapeless mess of broken struts and tangled steel wire fell vertically to earth, weighted by its heavy engine, which was still roaring at full throttle. It was so low that it hit the ground within seconds. Winter throttled back and came round in a gentle turn to see the wreckage. Not a movement. It was just a heap of junk in a field. Ginger was circling it too. From this height the sky was a vast bowl as smooth and shiny as Ming. They both looked round it, but the other two seaters had gone. There were no planes in sight. <clears throat> Winter increased his throttle and came alongside Ginger. He pushed his goggles up. Ginger was laughing. The artillery fire had stopped, or perhaps its explosions were lost in the mist. They turned for home, scampering across the trees and hedges, like two schoolboys. Winter and Ginger came over the airfield in echelon. Eight aeroplanes were lined up outside the canvas hangars that lacked only bunting to be a circus. A dozen officers fell over themselves, scrambling out of the mess tent. One of them waved. 
Winter's machine, painted bright green with wasp-like white bands, was easily recognised. Winter circled the field while Ginger landed. He'd literally lived in this French field for almost a year, knew each tree, ditch and bump. He'd seen it from every possible angle. He remembered praying for a sight of it with a dead motor and a boot full of blood. Also, how he'd focused on blurred blades of its cold, dewy grasp, following a long night unconscious after a squadron booze-up. He'd vomited, excreted, crashed and fornicated on this field. He couldn't imagine being anywhere else. For the first time in a month the sun shone, but it gave no warmth. As he switched off his engine, the petrol fumes made the trees bend and dance on the heavy vapour. Pops hurried across to him, but couldn't resist the quick inspection of the tail before saluting. Everything in order, her major? Winter was still a little deaf, but he guessed what the sergeant was saying. He always said the same thing. Yes, sergeant, the strut is damaged, but apart from that, it probably just needs a few patches. Winter unclipped his goggles, unwound his scarf and took off his leather helmet. The cordite deposits from his spanders had made a black band across his nose and cheeks. Another Englishman, said Pops. He warmed his hands before the big Mercedes engine, which was groaning softly. Bristols, one forced down, one destroyed. We lost the new young officer, though. Winter was ashamed that he didn't know the boy's name, but there were so many of them. He knew he was right to remain unfriendly to all of them. Given half a chance, new kids would treat him like some sort of divinity, and that made him feel like hell when they went west. Winter wiped the protective grease from his face. He was calm. Briefly, he watched his own unshaking hand with a nod of satisfaction. He knew himself to be a nerveless and relentless killer, and like any professional assassin, he took pride in seeing a victim die. Only such men could become aces. The end. Yeah, quite a dark story there. Um, and I suppose any story about war is necessarily dark, isn't it? Dark and upsetting because how can it be anything else? People killing each other. So it, it's never much fun and it, it shows a, the stark reality of, of the... Um, of the war, and particularly this war, I don't even know what one it is, the Second World War, the fact that he doesn't even take the time to learn the young soldiers' names because they come and go too frequently. He's, he's saying, what's the point in making friends with these young officers when they're just going to die like the one did, you know? He said to him, stay close, stay on my wing, but all of a sudden he's off, um, yeah away from the action and in trouble so it's very sad but but I thought it was very uh very weird that this short story again I'm just going through them finding interest in ones that I can find some stuff about are you very welcome Hannah it's my pleasure uh, so, so there's so many short stories in here some of them I can't find any information about so I prefer to read the ones where I can find information about them rather than just come on the stream and be like Oh yeah, I'm going to read a short story, don't know what it's about, let's find out. I mean, some people might enjoy that, but I think many people would much rather a little synopsis, a little a little interest, um, a synopsis, a little introduction, what's to come. And I mean, we, we've discovered that this is about war and flying. Um, yeah, you're welcome, Hannah, and I'm glad you enjoyed it, Becky. Um, it was beautiful, beautiful descriptive writing, wasn't it? And And... Obviously, he's the the author has um, he's either got a great interest in war and flying, and um, <laughs> that, that's great, Becky. I said, didn't I? That it's even better than Top Gun, right? Better than the new Top Gun Maverick. If anyone tells you, "Oh, have you seen Top Gun Maverick?" Say, "I haven't," but I've listened to the live reading of Winter's Morning, and it's even better. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, and it's very funny because Roald Dahl's Going Solo that we're going to read on Sunday night at 8. Let me just show you. Here's Roald Dahl in a similar place to um, Mr. Winter, Sergeant Winter. And we're going to learn even more about the RAF and the early flying from Roald Dahl because he was a, a forerunner in the Second World War. Um, 
in the RAF, in these planes. So we're going to learn a lot more about it in Roald Dahl's beautifully, uh, again, descriptive and um, entertaining and funny way. How he writes is so beautiful. So I'm looking forward to share that. And, and again, I'll say tomorrow um, is the first day of Advent, Advent, the first of December. So I'll be reading the first of December, the first chapter from Josephine Garda's The Christmas Mystery. I'll be doing that in the afternoon. Um, and then I'll try and bring another short story in the evening. So, yeah, I can't see why I'll do that. I'll have a bit of time tomorrow afternoon and it's only a short chapter. And I'll try and bring two um, two readings each day, you know, uh, on the ones when I would normally, um, the Christmas mystery, a short story. And then on Sunday, you'll have the Christmas mystery chapter and Going Solo by Roald Dahl. So, guys, that's all for this evening. I hope you enjoyed it. Seems that some of you uh, who, who managed to join did. Um, yes, Becky, <laughs> very different um, than Top Gun. And uh, yeah, guys, that's all for this evening. So I hope you can make tomorrow either the Christmas mystery or whatever short story we decide to read. It's a bit of a lottery. There's so many short stories that we're working our way through. If you haven't seen the playlist, there's a playlist with them all in. You're welcome, Becky. You're welcome, Hannah. And thanks, Leanne, also for joining. I hope you enjoyed it. So I'll be back tomorrow for two readings and then... Sunday for going solo. So guys, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week. And I hope to see you at one of the live streams. Take care, guys. See you.